It's been one year since the first case of COVID-19 was diagnosed in Louisiana. Now, our community grapples with moving toward a new normal. COVID-19 in Louisiana, one year later. With your host, Carly Lang. Good evening, I'm Carly Lang. Thank you all so much for joining us. It's crazy to think one year ago today, March 9th, 2020, that Louisiana's Health Department confirmed that COVID-19 was found here in the state. Well, in the last year, we've all had to adapt to a new normal as we work to contain this pandemic. Over the next half hour, we'll talk to several key leaders here around South Louisiana about the impacts of COVID-19, what we've learned over the last year, and where we go from here. So we start things off with a very special guest tonight, Louisiana's Governor John Bell Edwards. He's made several pivotal and to some controversial decisions since the outbreak of this pandemic. Let's check in now with Harry. Harrison Golden. Thank you so much, Carly. And joining us right now, representing the great state of Louisiana, Governor John Bell Edwards. Governor, thank you so much for your time today. Harrison, it's good to be with you. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. So one whole year since Louisiana reported its first known COVID-19 case. Amazing to see how far we've come. And so on this anniversary, where does the state stand in this fight? Well, certainly we're doing better than we were at the start of the year uh, when we were at the peak thus far in the pandemic in terms of positivity of tests, uh, case growth, hospitalizations, deaths, all of that. Uh, we've done much better, um, and, and I will tell you, I'm gratified by that. A lot of people are doing good work when it comes to slowing the transmission uh, by, by masking and distancing. The challenge we have is that we've got these variants, uh, especially the UK variant, we, we, we know to be all over Louisiana, um, and it's more easily transmitted, and, it, and it's a little bit uh, more virulent, meaning that that if you get COVID-19 from this variant, you're likely to have a, a more serious case. We're really racing uh, to get as many people vaccinated as possible while we're trying to slow the transmission uh, down, especially as it relates to the variant, which is why we have the uh, the mask mandate uh, still in place. We often hear that challenges bring in the best of people, bring people together. And of course, in many ways, as you've seen, it certainly has done that. But how has COVID-19 also exposed the disparities, inequities even, between people in our society? Yeah, well, Harrison, as you know, we were, I think, the first state in the nation to release a report last April that detailed uh, the disparate impact COVID-19 was having in Louisiana uh, with respect to race. Uh, so, for example, at that time, almost 70 percent of the deaths were among African-Americans in Louisiana, even though they comprise only 33 percent of the state's population. Now, that number, uh, that percentage, I should say, has come down over time. Uh, but African-Americans are still overrepresented. And this uh, pandemic has shown a spotlight on that. Um, and, and obviously, we created the Health Equity Task Force to help deal with that. Um, they have made uh, tremendous strides uh, forward, uh, helping us deal with the pandemic and then beyond the pandemic as well, because uh, we have a lot of work to do in Louisiana. Um, but but I, I, I will tell you that that was a very sobering uh, point in, in the response to the pandemic when we realized the disparate impact. And and look, we, we're closing in on 10,000 deaths and, and they're, they're white, black, Hispanics and so forth. This This disease, this virus doesn't discriminate um, but we know that there was a more vulnerable uh, part of, of uh, our state that has been more heavily impacted, and that's what we're trying to alleviate now. Of course, and one way we've seen people come together in the meantime is through vaccines. More Louisianians, of course, getting them by the day, including yourself. So what kind of timeline do you see for making more people eligible here in our state? Yeah, well, eligibility uh, will be expanded depending on when we have slack. Uh, that starts to show up in the scheduling system. Everyone has to make an appointment um, for the vaccine. And, and by the way, I encourage everybody uh, to mask, to distance, and to be vaccinated as soon as you are able to do that. And by accepting whichever of the three vaccines is available to you first. And as we speak right now, Louisiana is sandwiched between two states that have removed their mask mandates and again loosened some of their restrictions. That's to say Texas to the left of us, Mississippi to the right. Louisiana's capacity caps, of course, loosening now under phase three of recovery. So how big a test is this that we're facing right now for people when it comes to taking this virus seriously and still taking this virus seriously? Well, you know, Harrison, that, that's a good question. And um, look, I've got more than I can say grace over in Louisiana. I don't comment on what other states do and what other governors do. 
I will tell you that everything I can gather from the CDC, from the White House Task Force, but also from the uh, Office of Public Health here in Louisiana, um, all the epidemiologists with whom I consult on these issues, uh, the next uh, 30 to 45 days is going to be critically important. We are in a race now uh, to prevent uh, the transmission of that of the virus while we get people vaccinated. We know masks work. Uh, we know that transmission is lowered when people wear masks. Um, and so I am, I am not ready uh, to ease the mask mandate because there is no way to do that without sending the signal that it is safe for you to circulate in public without a mask on. And that happens to not be the case. I want to close here with a look at the, that long view. So how has this pandemic, pandemic changed Louisiana's future? The way it has for everyone, um, it, it has been very challenging. Uh, it has obviously impacted our economy and livelihoods and um, the uh, revenue that we have in Louisiana that impacts our budget and so forth. Um, but we've already recovered much of the economic damage uh, that happened in the state of Louisiana. I'm optimistic that, that going forward, we have a very, very, very bright future and that we're going to fully recover from this. Um, but we know that we have some long term things to do as well. We're going to have to continue to diversify our economy. We're going to have to promote uh, tourism and travel again. Uh, we're going to have to do all, all of those things as we improve our health care delivery system, continue to improve it uh, so that these health disparities uh, do go away uh, and that more people have access uh, to high quality, affordable health care uh, so that they are healthier. And Governor John Bell Edwards, thank you so much for your time here. Thank you. And up next, we'll sit down with East Baton Rouge Mayor President Sharon Weston Broom for an update on East Baton Rouge Parish and where the capital city goes from here. COVID-19 was first confirmed in New Orleans. It didn't take long for the virus to make its way up I-10 here to East Baton Rouge Parish. We turn now to Jonah Gilmore with a closer look at how the parish and the city of Baton Rouge have adapted in the last year. We're now joined by East Baton Rouge Mayor President Sharon Weston Broom. Mayor Broom, thank you for being here with us today. Yes, thank you for inviting me to participate. We want to start by you just reflecting back and t uh, talking about what things you guys have done to combat COVID-19 here in the area. One of the most significant uh, things we did was to stand up the first uh, clinic testing site for COVID-19, drive-through testing site, I should say, for COVID-19. And that was done without any federal or state dollars, but a pure collaborative effort with all of our local uh, hospitals donating uh, their service and uh, donating their tests. Small businesses have been the thing that people have been really concerned about. I mean, what do you tell those small business owners who are still, you know, suffering with the impacts from COVID-19? We have been um, establishing or have established some grants for small uh, businesses to utilize. Uh, with our Restart VR program. There are a few other initiatives out there, one with the state. During this season uh, where we're navigating uh, this pandemic, it has certainly prompted and uh, caused us to be innovative and creative in our approach. Uh, and so I certainly uh, believe that that is an approach that our businesses, small businesses, have to um, implement as well. Overall, we all, whether it's um, me as a government leader, city parish government, our business community, we all have to be innovative and creative and collaborate to be as resourceful as possible to keep everyone lifted during this season. Where do we go from here? And what does the parish look like post vaccination? I look forward to the day where all of our residents who want the vaccine have access to the doses that they need. And of course, my hope is that the majority of our citizens here will get vaccinated. Um, we know that if the majority of our community becomes vaccinated, we will be one step closer to uh, some sense of normalcy. And it's important for our residents to continue to take those precautions to protect our community. 
uh, like wearing a mask and uh, practicing those mitigation efforts that I believe are part of the fabric of our life, like social distancing and uh, washing our hands. We want to make sure that we limit the spread of COVID-19 while our community waits to be vaccinated. And you talk about those mitigation efforts. It seems like Louisiana and East Baton Rouge Parish is going in the right direction. So it seems like people have been following those mitigation efforts. Any last words for any people that are out there that say, hey, we're almost there, you know, we're still journeying on. What do you tell them? Any parting words, Mayor Broom? I will tell them, remember, this is short term discomfort for long term gain. Stay the course, mitigate, wear your mask, wash your hands, practice social distancing. And before you know it, this time next year, I firmly believe things will look a whole lot different and a whole lot uh, more promising, if you will, for us as a community. Well, thank you so much, Mayor President Sharon Weston Broom from joining us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. And when we come back, the lingering economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, and when experts say we may be able to see some normalcy again in our economy. Well, this pandemic has not only affected the health of Louisiana and the world, but it's also left a major mark on our economy. Kellyanne Biley brings us a closer look at the lingering impacts of COVID-19 on your wallet and how long it may be before businesses bounce back. Thanks, Carly. Joining us now is Adam Knapp. He's the chief executive officer for the Baton Rouge Area Chamber, commonly referred to as BRAC here across the capital city. Adam, thanks for joining us. Happy to be here. Thanks. I want to get your expert opinion on how you think COVID-19 has taken its toll on Baton Rouge economically over this past year. It has been a, uh, it goes without saying, a really tough year for business owners to, to, to let through the dynamics of shutdowns and then restarts. You know, the governor uh, has only recently returned Louisiana or sent Louisiana into phase three. Uh, we know today, probably without like the federal uh, interventions and the state support the programs that have been there, uh, we probably would have seen dramatic closures throughout the region. Uh, we saw also a huge effect on individuals who lost jobs. What would you say exactly to individuals on how they can support getting our economy back to where it needs to be? If you are unemployed still or underemployed from where you were pre-pandemic, uh, there's a lot of resources to help folks think about what they can take advantage of. One, there's programs through our Louisiana and the community, community technical college system, helping people gain access to new skills, whether through short term or long term training to see where new job opportunities are going to be coming from and to get yourself positioned for jobs in those fields. Now that we have these vaccines rolling out, how do you see that impacting the economy, say within the next six months? It's a huge part of the confidence of business owners to, to have their talent back in the building again. And many employers still have never had their individuals come back building. So imagine the vaccine is really the barrier for a lot of folks to getting there. So seeing the rollout really accelerating has a lot to do with employer confidence and individual employee confidence. Let's look at the long term now, because obviously the implications of what has happened with this pandemic is going to be something we're going to be dealing with for years from now. What do you think and do you think it's possible that we can bounce back? I do. In fact, I think we, we still expect we're going to see back to full recovery of our economy uh, end of this year, early next year. So the, the forecasts have been around 2022 for that. Um, and so we should see an accelerating pickup, really uh, seeing industrial construction coming back, you know, the project with ExxonMobil that we're competing for and a number of others, Shintech recently announcing a billion dollar investment. That has been a big missing piece of our economy that disappeared after March that will have a lot to do with getting back to normal. Uh, as well as our small and mid-sized employers feeling the confidence to staff back up again and replace some of the positions they lost before. I think that it's important that we view this like we felt in 2016 after the flood. We really need to rally and come together to, to pull together as a community for the future and feel like we did after the 2016 flood when we were there for all of our neighbors. And that spirit of community cooperation and, and resiliency is going to be what makes this a stronger place after the 
Well, certainly some excellent advice there. I want to thank you for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Adam. And folks, stick around. We'll have more coming up after the break. Well, we're coming to the end of this BR Proud special on the one year anniversary of COVID-19. But before we go, we of course have to talk about our children. They've also had to adapt to an entire year of school that was anything but normal. Courtney Williams spoke to the head of our school nurses in Ascension Parish about how their jobs have changed to keep kids safe during this pandemic. It was a lot more than we expected. It really did hit, it hit hard. Those are just some of the words Ascension Parish Schools nurse coordinator Jill Gotro describes the COVID-19 pandemic when it first hit the area one year ago. We were ready to tackle this. Um, I have a very, very good nursing staff. Gotro says the work piled on and staff had double the responsibility that went beyond school hours. There were some days that I know some nurses and principals and staff stayed sick to, at school till 6 and 7 o'clock at night to make sure that those positive cases were handled. Everybody knew what they needed to know. The parents understood why their children were placed on quarantine. It was a lot on everybody. And staying on top of CDC guidelines presented another set of challenges. One day quarantine guidelines, um, August, September, October, November, we had, everybody got used to it. It was all great. We were polished. We knew we, we had a system going. In December, it all changed. Although things were changing, the support kept everyone going to make it through one year later. It took everyone's um, time and effort and extra time and effort to get through this together. From the, from, from, from the nutrition department, the maintenance department, the custodian department, from public information department, and Ms. Alexander's entire administration. If we did not work together, and appreciate each other's input and support, we would not have made it to this day. Joining us now is Livingston Parish School System Superintendent Joe Murphy. Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, Carly. How are you today? I'm doing good. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been a whirlwind of a year dealing with this pandemic. Looking back, what has the school system there in Livingston done to adapt to COVID and making sure you still are educating students? So, you know, we began school on August 7th in a hybrid form. Uh, an AB form and a fully virtual form and a face-to-face -face form. So when we started on August 7th, we were running all these different groups, but as we moved through the school year and as, as restrictions have allowed, we've made a concerted effort here in Livingston Parish to get our kids back into our classrooms five days a week, and that's been a real focus for us. The pandemic has disrupted everything, not just being in person. What has the school system done to make sure the students have access to not only learning, but basic necessities, you know, food, Wi-Fi, the things like that to be able to educate students? It's been a real challenge outside the educational realm of just, you know, making sure the students have the curriculum, making sure that the, the content gets taught. We've done all that, but we've also had to make special efforts. If we have virtual children, we've offered them meal services in our parish. We've extended our Wi-Fi reach out into our communities by establishing some access points uh, with some private entities here in Livingston Parish. And I want us to say that we're also still looking at new ways to try to extend that connectivity. You know, connectivity is a big issue, especially in rural areas where uh, students may not have access to the Wi-Fi. How have you guys changed throughout the last year to make sure you're accommodating students? <laughs> You know, we started off with all these different groups of students. We still have some students who are of COVID concerns who cannot attend. So we've actually opened up a virtual academy, K to eight. Uh, we went online with that in January. We transferred those kids off of our teachers in our schools into that academy. And now that academy is still taught by our teachers, but it's not taught during the school day. Teachers have been phenomenal. They've stepped up. They've taken on all these challenges. Some have put their own health risk behind them just so they can be there with their children. And I'm so thankful for those people. And 
I know this is going to sound corny, but I, I'm thankful to be the superintendent at Livingston Parish Public Schools. And speaking of teachers, you know, vaccinations are starting to roll yeah. out. How does uh, the school system there plan on facilitating that when it is available for teachers to have that opportunity? Well, I'm actually glad you asked that question because we have our first round of vaccinations that will occur in our parish and it will be administered by our nurse professionals. We right now have 681 employees scheduled to be vaccinated on March the 10th by our nurse professionals here in our, uh, our district. We just found out today we're getting the, the Pfizer vaccine and they're telling us we're going to get what we ordered. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time today and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Carly. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you all so much for joining us for this Be Our Proud special COVID-19 in Louisiana one year later. Tonight, there is light at the end of the tunnel as vaccines continue to roll out across our state, but the lasting impacts of COVID-19 will be felt for a while to come. For all of us here at Be Our Proud, I'm Carly Lang wishing you a safe and healthy 2021. Have a great night.